I'm delighted to be joined by, quite simply, one of the toughest men on the planet. Tyson Fury is the world lineal heavyweight champion. After suffering with addiction and mental health issues, he's gone from being the bad boy of boxing to becoming one of the most beloved fighters in the world. As well as fighting in the WWE and making music with Robbie Williams, now he's telling his incredible story in his brand new book. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one and only Tyson Fury! Thank you, Thank you very much. Oh, please, thank you, Steve. What a pleasure. You might not oh. fit in there, mate. <laughs> I've had so many guests on the show once. I've never had a guest just settle into the chair and I felt the whole stage move. <laughs> you just like that and you're like, oh, there you go, that's that. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. What a name. Let's not muck around. Tyson Fury. <clears throat> you were born to box. I was, yes. I was named after Mike Tyson, born 1988, when Mike Tyson was in the height of his career. Um, yeah, born seven weeks premature. I love this, the story. Died three times. Yeah. Always been a fighter and grew up to be six foot nine, 19 stone, heavyweight champion of the world! Yeah. And what the... Um, the only thing I love about you is, and I'm, about boxers in general, really, sort of going back to like Muhammad Ali and the, the, the poetry that used to slip out of his mouth. There was a beautiful, when you were in front of Deontay Wilder's kind of crew and you were there on your own and you said, and I'm quoting you here, I'll fight any man born of his mother. And then I think you followed it up with, come on then, you shithouse rat. <laughs> which. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but I that loved, was poetry. It was, but it was, it was this moment of eloquence that you were like, just, it was so funny. But I was curious, do you, do you think, like, as a comedian, my brain was like, did he think of that beforehand? Do you, do you kind of write it? Do, do you improvise? No, I don't, actually. It's, it just comes to me. Yeah. While I'm in the moment, while yeah. I'm there in front of these opponents or in a press conference or whatever, yeah. then it's all, it all just comes out. Have you ever done anything really mad to kind of psych out an opponent? Yes, I have. I've done plenty of mad stuff. Yeah. I once came to a press conference dressed as Batman <laughs> and um, had a full-on fight with the Joker. Yeah. Made it like a scene from a movie. And then I ran away, got rid of the Joker, came back dressed in a suit and said, sorry, I'm late, everybody. Right, nice. That was kind of crazy. Who, and then who, were you, was, who were you fighting then? I was fighting Vladimir Klitschko. Right. And then this one time, in about 2011, yeah. I was over in Vladimir Klitschko's training camp in Austria. And I remember being in the sauna with Vladimir Klitschko. Um, full sawn, it was like really hot in there and I, I only went in to have a couple of minutes and get out but I could see him staring at me across the room <laughs> yeah. and it was like I knew and he knew that it was on. Yeah. And this was the beginning of the mind warfare in my mind yeah. and everybody else got out and it was down to me and Vlad and I was like, I'm prepared to pass out in here. <laughs> but I was totally, totally smashed. I felt like fainting and he gets up and he turns the clock around for another 20. I was like, shit. And I ended up getting... He, he lost, he gave up in the end, and yeah. he walked out, he was in a right mood. And I thought, I can't just get up after him. Exactly. Go, wow, I've got to yeah. stay in a little bit longer. Yeah. So it was a, it was a tough challenge for... Uh, to get a mental win over Vladimir. And I believe, years later, he remembered how mentally strong I was in that sauna, and it was part of the key victory where I beat him. The first time I beat Vladimir was in the sauna in 2011 in Austria. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... They were laughing. You're filthy. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about the book. Um, it, I mean, it's out this week, isn't it? It's a book called Behind the Mask. It is. It's and a real insight into my life story from the beginning yeah. to right up to date. Um, it talks about the highs and the lows. It talks about upbringing. It talks about faith. It talks about suicidal thoughts. It talks about attempting suicide. It talks about... 28 stone weight loss, being, being addicted to drugs and alcohol. It talks about the recovery. What inspired you to write it? What? I first started writing the book about three years ago. Right. Um, I was heavily depressed at the time, and I was 28 stone when I started writing the book. But I thought to myself, I want to jot all this down while I'm going through it so people can get a real insight on what it's like to be unwell while you're writing something. Yes. 
Um, and did you keep that in or did you re-edit? No, no, it's all kept the same because I wanted to show people how you, your mindset can change from the beginning of a story to the end of wow. a book, you know what I mean? The yeah, journey. yeah, but I think that's what makes you so fascinating because you're, you're clearly, let's not muck around, hard as shit. <laughs> but you're, you're, you've got no problem showing emotion. I haven't. I've always been a crier and that, uh, uh, like emotional stuff, even movies, like sad kids movies and stuff, I'll cry over today. Oh, really? Yes. God, that must freak someone out in the cinema. <laughs> like, they're like, they're just watching Toy Story and like, is that Tyson Fury? <laughs> like, I, I remember going to the cinema, me and my wife, and we watched a, a film about a dog called Marley and Me. Yeah. And I absolutely cried my eyes out all the way through the movie. <laughs> Do your kids see you in that kind of... State? Yeah, I, I, I bring the kids up to, to show love and show emotion. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, want, I want that in, in our lives. Yeah. It's no good being a big tough man all the time, is it? And, of and can't show love and affection and, yeah. and tears. The other thing that's very interesting, it's a real insight into, I guess, success, is that you were the heavyweight champion of the world, and that's when you became depressed. It's quite a complex situation, really, because I've always suffered with um, anxiety and depression all the way through my life, or just at different times, different parts, but I always had a goal of becoming heavyweight champion of the world, yeah. and I always put it to the back of my mind. I had a lot of trauma going on, like, during uh, the process of becoming champion. I lost, like, uncles who were close trainers and lost children at birth and stuff like that. And I put it all to the back of my mind because I didn't want to think about it. I never had time to think about it at that time. Yeah. I was too focused on achieving my goals. So I remember being outside with my dad and brothers during the build-up, and he said, oh, what are you going to do after the fight? I said, I'm probably going to be down and depressed for a couple of years. I could almost feel it coming, but I couldn't stop it. All my eggs were in one basket. Yeah. And that basket was to defeat Klitschko and become the heavyweight champion of the world. And I knew that when I did that, then I wasn't going to have a goal anymore. Yeah. And there was nothing more to strive for. And it all came crashing down. I was so unwell at the time. I lost the passion to be alive. And I wanted to die. And, and I often thought about committing suicide until one day I couldn't think about it anymore. And I, I really went for it. And I was going to crash a car into a bridge. And... Just when I was about to hit, like, the bridge, something said to me, like, don't do this. Think about your kids. You're going to leave your kids with no father and your wife's not going to have a husband and everything's going to be shitty. And I pulled out last minute, like... Yeah. And I thought to myself, I can't suffer like this anymore. I've got to come out of it. I've got to be open about it. So because how... before I felt like, oh, I'll be a weakling if I come out. Yeah. I can't tell people what's going on. I'm supposed to be a, a big, tough boxer and all that. Yeah. I didn't feel I could open up to anybody because everybody around me, including all my family and friends, they thought like, oh, he's an attention seeker or right. the man's got everything and he's not happy and yeah. he's won world titles and he's still not happy. Nothing's going to make him happy. But it just made me worse because that's the worst thing you can say to someone who's suffering with depression at that time. Yeah. How do you go from that level of self-destruction yeah. to where you are today? And I think the real turning point was I thought to myself, if I'm feeling like this, then there's got to be other people out there feeling the same. Yeah. And I'm going to express how I'm feeling and see if anyone can help or put, it, put the finger on what's going on with me. You can only really get well again when you admit to yourself that you're ill yeah. and admit that you need help and, and seek medical advice immediately. Yeah. If I would have went years before, I wouldn't have had to have a breakdown. But I believe that the breakdown has helped me be the man I am today because I didn't appreciate life before that. Even in the good times, yeah. before the breakdown, I still wasn't happy. And now, like, I appreciate so much more things that are so simple in life. Like, just getting up in the morning and going for a run and, and having a drink of water. Just r normal things that we all take for granted on a daily basis. So are you really at that place? I'm really at that place. Wow. I've never been as happy as I am now. Yeah. I believe that... Once you've got mental health problems, they never go away. You just learn to manage them, maintain. Yeah. But I've got a good method now of managing my life and, and, and doing what I know is going to keep me well, and that's training and, and being around positive people and, 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 and being positive myself and giving positive vibes off and trying to help others as much as I can. Yeah. And, and it's re it really has helped. And it was in what was incredible as well, it, it felt like around the time... Because, you, I mean, you, you know, you said stuff that, that upset people, that's fair to say. Yeah. You know, and but it felt like the the Deontay Wilder fight really changed public perception about you. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think it's the whole comeback story, isn't yeah. it? To come back from 28 stone and, and almost suicide yeah. to go back and, and back to the heavyweight top of the division again. Yeah, and that, that fight, I mean, Jesus, when you got up 
Have you watched that footage back? Many times. Yeah, yeah. It's just his face. <laughs> when you get up, it's real like, what? How? I just, and you were, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Are you confident about the rematch? Very confident because other than the knockdowns, he never won around. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm very confident in the yeah. rematch. I'm match fit now. I've had yeah. five or six fights back and I've been active now two years again. Yeah. I'm back, back to my best. Now let's talk about WWE. What the fuck's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> it's so like, because we were like, hey, what, what was that? Well, <laughs> what happened with WWE was this. I was at home after the fight with Otto Wallen in Vegas, minding my own business, and I get a phone call from an, an agent from America saying, yeah. would you be interested in, in fighting in the WWE? Yeah. And I thought about it for about five seconds, and I said, Paris, pack the bags, we're going. <laughs> that was it, we was on a plane to Los Angeles, and then the next thing I was, I was doing uh, work for the WWE. And do you think that's something that you'll do when your boxing career finishes, or...? Well, it's something that I'm not going to close the door on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really did enjoy it, and it was, it was a good laugh, and yeah. everybody's had a good laugh at me for doing it, whatever. Uh, no, no, no. It's and just, my kids it, loved it. So, yeah, well, yeah. totally. But it was just that thing of like, well, that's what you can't really sort of pigeonhole you because what, one minute you're a boxer, then you're doing WWE, then I read a, <laughs> a story that you're doing a, a Christmas song with Robbie Williams. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot going on. How did so how did that happen? I was in Las Vegas fighting like, in the summertime this year. Yeah. Robbie Williams was out there. He came to one of the fights. Um, and he came backstage to see me and he said, oh, you're a bit of a singer, you like singing after your fights? I said, yeah. He said, would you like to do a Christmas song with me? I said, yeah, we'll do that. So, yeah, it was really uh, exciting and very happy to be singing with a legend like Robbie! <laughs> and were you, were you kind of, like, singing it in the shower? Were you getting yourself ready? Do you know what? I drive around with it on in the car all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the kids know every word yeah. to it. It's really catchy. It's going to be... I think it's going to do really well. And it gets even better because the title of the Christmas song is Bad Sharon. How does it go? Sing it, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've seen you. You like to sing. How does Bad Sharon go? Oh, it goes like this. Grab Bad Sharon from the office. Nick the champagne. Let's get off it. Nice. There you go. Did you... <clears throat> I'm just reading what's going on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You do. laughs> Um, do, doing all these things, like Robbie Williams and WWE, are you sort of worried that you're not training as hard? It, it is a concern for yeah. managements and trainers and family and all that sort of stuff, but things have happened to me in the last year that I never thought would ever be possible, like just to be doing a Christmas song with Robbie Williams, yeah. releasing an autobiography, and I've also got a, um, an ITV documentary as well, Beat the Furies. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so it's all happening as well. I've also had an offer from um, Sylvester Stallone to do a movie. Have you? So, yeah. What? So, what who what knows? We, what are we doing with it? Is that another Rocky? It's not another Rocky. Apparently, it's it's an action movie, and they're looking for a, a villain to, to star as a, a bad guy in, in one of his movies. Probably get beat up by him. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm keeping fit, ticking over. But my boxing training won't start until I enter a boxing training camp, yeah. which will be eight weeks long, um, and it'll start in January, and I'll fight at the end of Feb. I read a story as well. A lot of boxers, um, when they're in the eight weeks, they don't have sex. I've heard that as well. D <laughs> yeah. Have. Have. <laughs> Do you adhere to that? Um, no, I don't. Oh, really? Because it's an housewife's tale. Right. It's like an old school thing from maybe 100 years ago, whatever. I actually, early on in my career, it was like, oh, you watch the Rocky movies, you try and emulate all that sort of stuff, yeah. drink raw eggs and don't, don't have sex before fights or yeah. whatever. And I actually spoke to a doctor, one of the main doctors in the world, about all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And apparently, if you don't have sex for, like, a week, you feel like having sex. If you don't have sex for two weeks, maybe you feel like it a bit more. But after that, it goes down. The, the, the urge to have sex after that, the testosterone level, for a male especially, drops yeah. to a point where, after five or six weeks, you're not interested at all. And when he was telling me this, I was like, OK, how, how does this work? So he explained it all. <laughs> Um, he told us that it's good to, say, have sex maybe three or four days before the fight. So, presumably, all of you are then running back to your wives and girlfriends with a note from a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Says we have to. <laughs> now, 
Will we ever get the uh, the Joshua fight? Is that going to happen? I'm hoping so. I'm yeah. really hoping so because he's got a big fight coming up in December. Yeah. And providing he wins that, then we will definitely see a uh, a fight between me and him. Hopefully next year coming. Where would that be? Well, I think the only place for it would be at Wembley Stadium yeah, or yeah. in the UK somewhere. Um, two British fighters fighting overseas. Don't really go down too well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it would be over here somewhere. I read a story about you prank calling him. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Tell me about that. Well, I have all these sort of, what you want to call them, celebrities' phone numbers in my phone book. And stuff. Yeah, because nobody's going to turn you down. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, can I have your number? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just like any other person. Who in here wouldn't call someone if they had a couple of drinks and, like... <laughs> I've got Wayne Rooney's phone number here. Shall I call him? <laughs> yeah, go on. It's, good, it's always a good idea when you're, uh, you've had a couple. And is, have you been prank calling Rooney and all? I have as well, yes. <laughs> but to be fair, is to that, be fair... Is that why you left he, the country? Yeah, he does return the favour. <laughs> Would you... Are you up for a prank call? Who you got in mind? Well, I've got my phone here. <laughs> but we could... Um, this would be fun. Who, who do you want to select? Do you want to go famous or non-famous? Famous. Okay. Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer... <laughs> I haven't got Jennifer... Who do you think I am? I ain't got Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> Is that who you'd like, Jennifer Lopez? Yeah, get her on the blower. I'm not going to get her on the... <laughs> I'm not Siri. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else have we got? Who have we got, got to substitute? We've got... Uh, I can do you Greg Davies. <laughs> That'd be the same, same size, you and him. Yes, he would be, yes. Right, I'm going to call him. Hello, I'm sorry, but the person... <laughs> <laughs> well, leave, leave a message. A message would be good. Hi, Greg, this is Tyson Fury. I've been asked to do a prank phone call, and they said to me, who do you want a prank phone call? I said, Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> and they said, oh, no, you can do Greg Davis. I said, Greg Davis, who the fuck is Greg Davis? <laughs> <laughs> he's, not, he's not joking, Greg, he's got me! <laughs> he's got me chained up to a radiator! <laughs> Me, you fucker, help me! <laughs> Who's the most famous person in your book? Most famous person in my book? Yeah, in your phone book. <sighs> Hang on, the phone's ringing. It's Greg. <laughs> Greg! <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Myself. <laughs> That's pushy. We're just here on live TV doing a prank phone call. Uh, hang on. And, and you were last on the list of people we wanted to call, but. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. Greg, you're about to shit yourself, mate, because. It's Tyson Fury. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's a really. I know that voice. I know the Gypsy King when I hear him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a very sexy voice, isn't it, Greg? <laughs> Almost too sexy, Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> do, uh, do you two want to get a fucking room? <laughs> <laughs> he just wanted to speak to someone bigger than him, didn't he? How tall are you? Because I saw you with Anthony Joshua. You looked like you were bigger than him. Six foot eight. Woo! I trump you, I'm six foot nine. <laughs> bitch! Oh, there's no need to call him a bitch, Tyson. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> you can call me a bitch, Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Greg, on that note, I'm going to say goodbye because it's going to get aggressive, this phone call. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Take it easy. Bye-bye. Hey, well done. Well done, mate. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have to end it there. Please give it up for my wonderful guest, the brilliant Tyson Fury!